Hello everyone. In today's session, we're going to talk about reporting details, methods, and protocols. Why, where, and how. So all of you have seen this diagram earlier in the course, which outlines different pieces that you can add to a standard scientific publication to make it more transparent, reproducible, and useful to others in the scientific community. And today we're going to focus, focus on the fourth row of this um, diagram. This conference will now be recorded. Hello everyone. In this week's class, we're going to talk about reporting detailed methods and protocols. Why, where, and how. So you've all seen this diagram earlier in the course, and you know that this outlines different pieces of information that you can add to a standard publication in order to make your work more transparent, reproducible, and useful for others within the scientific community. In this week's session, we're going to focus on line four, which is sharing detailed protocols of methods. And there are three things here that we can do, publicly share step-by-step -step protocols in a protocol repository, include research resource identifiers, or RID is in our protocol, and cite the protocol in our papers. So you might be wondering, isn't describing my methods in the method section of my paper sufficient? After all, it's called a method section, and that's what it's for. However, many of you will have had the experience of trying to reproduce methods based simply on what's reported in the method section of the paper, and you will have found that method sections are often lacking essential details. And so here is what we, an example of what we might find in a scientific paper if we were looking for a protocol on how to draw an owl. Um, we might find something that has two steps and says draw some circles and then draw the rest of the owl. And at least if you have my level of artistic ability, I think it would be very difficult for you to get from the two circles to this very detailed pencil sketch of an owl. Alternatively, we have a text description here that goes into great detail about the size and the weight of the paper that was used, the supplier of the pencils. But when it gets to the important part about how to draw an owl, it simply says we did so by looking at owls and drawing what we saw on paper. This protocol yielded one drawn owl. And so there's really no information about how to do the important part of the protocol that we really want to know about. So you might be wondering, why does this happen? Well, there are a number of reasons. One of those reasons is word limits. And so because there are word limits on entire papers, including the method section, authors will often cut words from the methods in order to leave more space in the results and the discussion. The second issue is format. So protocols are most useful when they are presented as step-by-step -step descriptions. The general verbal paragraph descriptions that we provide in a method section of a paper are typically not very useful for writing out scientific protocols. The other thing that can happen is a personnel mismatch. So the person writing the methods may not be the person who ran the experiment, and that can lead to essential details being omitted from the paper or incorrectly stated. And then the last thing is journal requirements, and we'll talk about this extensively. Some journals will ask authors to cite previous papers describing the methods instead of re-describing published, published methods. And this can also be a problem for reproducibility. So you might be wondering, well, do readers really need the full details of the methods? After all, I've given them information about, you know, the general details of what I've done. Um, do they really need all of the specifics? Isn't that just getting in the way of them understanding the big picture of the study that was performed? I think it's very important to keep in mind that different readers have different needs. And so all readers will need an overview of the study design and the methods you use to answer your research question. And that information should appear in the method section of your paper. All readers will also need information to assess scientific rigor and risk of bias. And this information should also appear in the method section of your paper. However, some of your readers are going to need the full details to reproduce the experiment. 
And while this is only some readers, these readers are particularly important because they are the ones that are most likely to follow up on your research and your experiment. And so protocol repositories offer a powerful way of sharing these intense or these very detailed methods with this very important audience who is working in our field and pursuing similar research questions or maybe using our, our methods to answer different research questions. So how can I share detailed methods? Well, there are four options. Each of these has advantages and disadvantages, and we'll discuss strategies for determining which approach is best for your situation. The first option is to use a methodological shortcut citation, and so this is where you cite a previous paper that describes your method. The second option is to describe methods in detail in the paper and in the supplemental files, and there are particular problems that we'll talk about with putting your methods in the supplement. The third option is to deposit your protocol in a protocol repository, and the fourth option is to publish a methods paper. Let's start off with option one, which is the methodological citation shortcut. So you might be wondering, what is a methodological citation shortcut? Well, this is where instead of describing the methods in detail, the authors cite a previous paper that used similar methods. So you might see language like, we did this method as previously described, followed by a citation. And there's some important context to remember here. Um, some journals have policies in place that actually require authors to use shortcut cita citations to describe methods that have been previously published instead of redescribing them. And there are some scientists who consider this to be best practice. However, there are others who've had difficulty finding detailed methods when they went back to those papers that were cited, and they worry that shortcut citations negatively affect reproducibility. So we did a meta-research study to look at this, and well, we started out by examining all of the different reasons that authors cite papers in the methods. And we found that there are a number of reasons why authors cite papers in the methods. Not all of citations in the methods section are shortcut, but many of them are. So here we have three different fields, neuroscience shown in the gold, biology shown in blue, and psychiatry shown in red. And you can see that in neuroscience and psychiatry, roughly half of the citations in the method sections were how citations that were used to explain a method, and almost all of these are going to be shortcut citations. And about a third of citations in biology were how citations or shortcut citations. Other very common reasons for citing a paper in the method included who or what citations. And so these are citations that are used to give credit or specify what materials were used, as well as why citations. And so these are used to provide context or justification. So instead of saying this is how something we did something, the authors will say this is why we did something. Previous work has shown that this method works best with our study population, therefore we use this method those types of things. Some less common reasons for citing a paper in the method section included a from whom citation specifying a source of data or materials or a formula or value. And citations that really didn't fit into any of these categories were rare. We kept track of the number of shortcut citations per paper, and these are divided into probable and possible for each method. So a probable shortcut citation means that um, the sentence where the citation occurred was the only sentence about that method, whereas a possible shortcut citation means that there were additional following sentences that just provided some additional information about how the method was done. So what you can see is that most papers have at least one shortcut citation and often papers have many shortcut citations. So um, an important part of our method section is being actually captured not in the publication itself, but in shortcut citations to other papers. So you might be wondering, why can't I just cite a previous paper that described the methods and what problems can occur when I use methodological shortcut citations? Well, there's theory and there's practice. Um, so in theory, the authors are citing a recent state-of-the-art methods paper or an original research article with a detailed description of the methods. The methods that the authors used are very similar or identical to those used in the shortcut citation, and the authors briefly explain any modifications. 
And there are often cases in the literature where that occurs, but there are also cases where that doesn't occur. So in practice, anecdotal evidence suggests that shortcut citations can create many problems for scientists who want to reproduce authors' methods. Here's an example of this. Um, so there are two anecdotal examples here. The first is someone who was looking for a protocol in a 1997 paper found as previously described in 96. In that paper found as previously described in 1987. And when they got to the 87 paper, they couldn't access it because it was behind a paywall. So they were unable to obtain the detailed methods they were looking for. In the second example, we go through a chain of three different citations that say devices were fabricated as previously described with references to progressively older methods. And when we get to the last citation in the chain, in 2009, the methods or section simply says devices were fabricated with conventional methods. So here again, the authors wasted a lot of time going through a series of shortcut citations, not just one to find details about the methods, and there were ultimately no methodological details in the original paper that was cited. So we also did a small case series as part of our research where we followed shortcut citations back to find detailed methods. And again, there were many cases in which we were able to find those methods. However, there were also problems. Um, and I want to highlight some of the problems that we ran into when we were attempting to get these detailed methods information. So the first was that we could not identify the citation. So perhaps the author name, year, or DOI was incorrect, and that prevented us from finding what paper the authors were citing. Um, there may have been a link to a dead website or perhaps a book version that was out of print. The next set of issues we had was problems accessing that citation. So the article may have been behind a paywall, perhaps it was an older article and no PDF was available, or we simply didn't have access to the book or resource that was being cited. The third issue was there were problems finding the cited method. So the method was not mentioned. Um, there may have been a book chapter or pages <coughs> cited and the pages weren't specified within that book or the chapter itself, making it very difficult to locate the specific method we're looking for, or the resource may have been published in a different language. And the next problem we ran into was that the description of the method was found, but it was not sufficient to describe the method that was being cited. So perhaps the method was not described or the description was similar to the citing paper. Um, the description may have been outdated and no longer state of the art, or the author simply provided a shortcut citation instead of offering a full description of their methods. And when authors provide a shortcut citation, we have to go through this entire set of steps again and again. We have the potential to run into problems at each of these phases of the chain. So my, you might be wondering, when is it appropriate to use a shortcut citation? We argue that there are three criteria that every shortcut citation should meet. So the first is that the cited resource describes the method in enough detail to allow someone else to implement the method. If there's not enough detail for the method to be implemented, then the resource is not an appropriate shortcut citation. The second is that the method you use is very similar or identical to the method used in the shortcut citation and any modifications can be briefly described in the method section of your paper. So, you may find a very detailed description of the method, but if it's not the method you use, then it's not useful as a shortcut citation. It has to be very close to what you did, and you have to be able to quickly tell people how you modified that method in your paper. And then the last condition is that the cited resource is open access. So we saw that the inability to get access to a shortcut citation is a barrier to reproducing methods, and open access is something that helps us to ensure that we remove that barrier. So is open access really that important? And yes, it is. So knowing how methods were performed is essential for reproducibility. And when shortcut citations are paywalled or they're in resources that not everyone has access to, then we are systematically depriving some readers of this information and creating obstacles for those with limited access. And it's important to remember that paywalls can also affect researchers at well-funded research institutions. Um, so one example of this is the issues that we have in Germany with not having access to papers published in Elsevier, Elsevier journals due to ongoing contracts disputes. 
One of the important pieces of this argument is that methodological shortcut citations need to meet higher standards because they provide crucial information about how the experiment was performed, which is essential for reproducibility. So we're arguing here that because this citation is replacing a section of your methods, it needs and it, it, it's a citation that people will need to refer to to understand how your work was done, it needs to meet some, some criteria that we wouldn't need to, that wouldn't be important if we were citing a paper for other reasons. So what if the resource that you want to cite doesn't meet these conditions? Well, here are some best practices for that situation. You can still cite the resource, but you want to cite the resource to give credit to its authors and not as a shortcut or a replacement for a part of your method section. If the method is relatively simple and straightforward and it can be described in detail in text of the paper or the supplemental files, you can consider doing this. However, you want to remember that protocol repositories that provide this step-by-step -step listing of each of your methods can be a more effective way of sharing methodological information, even for short protocols, and that these repositories make protocols easier to find version and fork. And we'll talk about versioning and forking a little bit later. Um, if you can't describe the method in your text, then you want to go ahead and deposit a protocol in a protocol repository and you can then cite the method as a shortcut citation. We'll talk more about how to do this later. So what are the potential problems with describing methods in the supplement? I've mentioned that this is the second option for how you should, could share your methods and it's not ideal. There are a number of problems here. The first is that just because readers have access to the paper doesn't mean that they have access to the supplemental files. So some publishers offer free access to supplemental files, whereas others do not. And if you request a paper through interlibrary loan programs or for another means, through another means, that paper often comes without the supplemental file and just with the, um, the actual text of the paper itself. The second issue is that information contained in supplements is not findable, so there's no way to tell if you're searching for information about a particular method, which papers have really detailed supplements describing that method and which do not, whereas if it's in a protocol repository, you can easily go type in your method and then search for all protocols that deal with that method. The next thing is that supplemental methods are not typically presented as detailed protocols. Um, again, they tend to be written in paragraph format and not as step-by-step -step protocols. And lastly, the supplemental files are static documents that cannot be versioned or forked. So versioning is when I create a new updated version of my own protocol. So let's say I posted a method two years ago, I've made some changes to the reagents and the procedures, I can post a new version. Forking is when I share a version of a protocol that reflects how I've adapted someone else's protocol. So let's say you post a protocol and I, you know, make some minor changes to that protocol or major changes for my work, I can create a fork, um, which is my new version of the protocol that someone else has created. And that allows the original creators to get credit as well as to see how others are adapting their methods. Okay. Um, so definitions of versioning and forking, I talked about this very briefly. Um, the important thing to note here, both of these are possible on Protocols.io, which is one of the protocols repository. Right now, Protocol Exchange, which is another protocol repository, offers versioning but does not offer forking. Um, we hope that that may be changed soon, but at present, Protocol Exchange only offers versioning and not forking. And the benefits of this, again, for authors are that versioned or forks protocols are linked to the original, and this makes it easier to find the original protocol. And it also helps us to track the evolution of protocols both between and within labs, as well as giving credit to those who posted the original protocol. So what are best practices for using shortcut citations? Um, the first is that we want to make sure that the shortcut citation meets the three criteria that we discussed previously. So we need a detailed description that it would allow someone else to reproduce the methods. The method needs to be close to the one that we are using such that any modifications can easily be described and the resource needs to be open access. 
protocols, methods, papers, and video protocols are ideal in terms of offering that detailed description that will help someone else to reproduce the methods. Original research method papers that describe the method in great detail can also be cited as shortcuts. The next thing we want to do is describe modifications. So when we're using a shortcut, we want to describe anything that we did differently from that shortcut citation in detail. And we want to version or fork protocols to show our exact um, protocols and methods. And then the other thing that's important to remember is to provide the exact location of the cited methods and to be very specific about what portion of the method that we're using. So specifying the exact location might include specifying page numbers, especially for long books or manuals where there's a lot of information and it's hard to find any one particular detail. Or you might describe the method name and location within the shortcut citation. So here's a visual summary. Um, when you're considering whether you should use a shortcut citation, ask yourself whether there's a resource that's available that meets the three criteria for a shortcut citation. If there is, then you can cite the resource as a shortcut and make sure that your citation gives enough information to allow others to very easily find the method that you cited within the cited resource. And make sure that you've clearly described all modifications in your own methods. And if you're using a protocol, you may want to version or fork that protocol so to describe your method. If there is no, criteria, no citation available that meets the criteria for shortcut citation, then you want to cite the resource to give credit and create your own shortcut citation by depositing your protocol in a protocol repository or publishing a methods paper. Okay, so this is a point of contention. Some scientists believe that you should always cite the first paper to use a method, whereas others prefer to cite a more recent paper that use methods that are more similar to their own. Who's right? It's not that anyone's right here, it's simply that these two beliefs reflect different reasons for citing a paper. Um, so citing the first paper that uses the method is about giving credit. It gives the cited author credit for developing that method. Whereas citing a more recent paper whose methods are similar to your own is about citing something as a shortcut citation. It's saying these are similar to the methods that we use and we're using this paper as a shortcut. The good news is you don't have to choose between these two things, you can do them both. And you want to write your sentence in a way that helps readers to distinguish between the credit citation and the shortcut citation. So here's an example where I have both a shortcut citation and a credit citation in the same paper. And so I might write the sentence, experiments were performed using an updated version of the protocol originally developed by Smith and colleagues. So my first citation, this updated version, is the shortcut citation. And then my second citation is clearly a credit citation to give credit to the original developers of this method. Okay, so what if you find yourself in a situation where no shortcut citation is available and the methods is too complex to describe in the text? Where can you deposit your protocol? There are two major options, protocol journals and protocol repositories. So let's talk about the differences between these two and why you would use one versus the other. So what are the differences between a protocol journal and a protocol repository? Well, the main difference that we're going to focus is that on is that a protocol repository allows you to share living protocols. So the results based for or the, the traditional publication format that we use for publications is heavily focused on results, which are static. Methods are different in that they're dynamic. The question about your methods is not if they will change, it is when they will change. We are all adapting our methods all the time to allow us to do new things, to allow the method to work in different circumstances, to reflect that the materials and reagents and organisms available to us may have changed. These things are all very common. So protocol repositories allow you to share a living protocol that can be updated, versioned, and forked over time, whereas protocol journals, generally, you're sharing a static publication that cannot be versioned and forked. It is simply the method is as it is at the time it is published, and no changes are really possible unless you go ahead and publish a you know, follow-up version of that same method. 
So examples of protocol journals include bioprotocol.org, Nature Journals, the current protocols in series, and the Journal of Visualized Experiments, Jovi. Protocol repositories include Protocols.io and Protocols Exchange. So protocol journals are static. They generally reflect what a single lab is doing at one point in time. They are often used for new innovative methods. It takes a lot of time for investigators to go through the writing up the protocol and um, the publication and peer review process. And so often that's only worth it if the method is new or innovative and something the authors want credit for. These methods can quickly become obsolete, and we also can't track protocol deviations, so there's no versioning or forking, and it's simply author's responsibility to describe deviations when they cite that paper. In contrast, repositories allow authors to very quickly share um, living protocols. So they can quickly update and share new versions. The repositories also, at least for protocols I.O., allow forking, so you can show how you've adapted someone else's protocol. Versions and forked protocols link back to the original, um, allowing us to track the evolution of methods within and across labs and allowing authors to see how others are reusing their methods. And then you can also create collections of similar protocols. Protocol journals are peer-reviewed, whereas protocol repositories generally are not. However, you can check citations, versioning, and forking of posted protocols. Protocols IO also has a works for me button, which will give you insight into whether others have successfully used the protocol. Effort required for protocol journals is higher than for a protocol repository. Both formats are GOI citable. You might be wondering, how can I get the best of both worlds? Um, PLOS One has a new article type that allows researchers to publish a methods article while depositing a protocols on protocols IO. And this is called a lab protocol article, although in practice it goes, it covers much more than lab protocols. Any reusable methods protocol can be deposited or published as a lab protocols article. So if you're interested in doing this and you have a protocol that you think merits publication in, in this way, um, then we would encourage you to check out our Publish My Protocol course. And in this course, we walk through students through the steps of depositing their protocol on Protocols.io and preparing a lab protocols article. So why should I deposit detailed protocols? Um, Depositing your protocols in a repository benefits you as well as your lab group. So this approach allows us to track changes over time as the protocol evolves. It allows us to determine what version of a protocol was used for a particular publication, because when you cite, you'll cite a particular version of your protocol in your paper. It provides long-term access to protocols. Even if you haven't used the protocols in years, the person responsible for that protocol has left the lab or you have moved on to another laboratory or institution. And then finally, depositing your protocols is advantageous because others can use and cite your protocol. And this allows you to establish collaborations with others who are building on your methods. Um, one important thing here, in addition, is that depositing a protocol decouples your methods from the rest of your paper. And that may allow someone who could benefit from your method, but is working in a very different context and would not read your paper um, to find your method. So let's say your protocol is on how to do a, a particular, or you know, you, you have a description of how to do a particular method in mice in cardiovascular disease. Um, other researchers working in other diseases might be very interested in that protocol, but they may not find it if they're not in a cardiovascular disease field where the results from your publication would be relevant to them. And so it allows people to find methods that are relevant to them, even if they're being published in fields that are quite different and in papers that they wouldn't normally read. What makes a protocol useful and easy for others to follow? Um, <clears throat> I will post the link to these videos in, in the chat, and I would encourage each of you to watch them on your own time. Um, but it's these are this is really just an excellent example of you know what how to write a protocol for something similar simple that we're all familiar with. In this case, how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I think these are valuable for illustrating the point that reproducing a protocol that you've never seen before can be quite challenging. 
and detailed instructions and short video segments can help future lab members and others to implement your protocol. And having clear detailed protocol saves everyone time. Okay, so how do I deposit a protocol? Um, you want to think of your protocol as a brief, modular, and self-contained publication. You're going to start off with a three to four sentence abstract where you want to give a context for the methodology and specify what the protocol produces. And so just like the abstract for a paper, reading the abstract for a protocol should help someone very quickly determine, is this protocol potentially useful to me? Is this the method that I'm looking for? You want to include as much detail as possible. So for example, the duration or time for each step or sub-step in your protocol, the amount of reagent, RRIDs for things that should have RRIDs, your vendor name and catalog number for supplies, you also want to include additional information like the expected results of your protocol, um, safety information, a chronology of steps, notes, recipes, as well as tips and tricks. So what tends to go wrong in this protocol? How can you help people to troubleshoot as they're working their way through the protocol? Protocols.io runs a lot of webinars on things like how to write good protocols, and if you want more information, that's a good place to look for additional details. Some more tips. As you're writing your protocol, you might want to identify critical steps and then specify the expected outcomes for that step so that you know if there's something that would tell researchers, for example, that the step has been successful, then that's important to report in your protocol. So for example, if you've done this properly, the solution should turn red. Um, you want to include timings for steps and subsets. So Protocols.io has an option where you can click the timing button to run the protocol and it will run through the timings for all of the steps to help you, you know, work through the protocol in your own research environment. What expertise would someone need to implement the protocol? So is this something where you need to have a lot of experience with particular type of methods, where you need to have a particular certification or training, or is this something that really anyone who has general lab experience could do? You also want to specify any assumptions that your protocol makes, as well as any limitations that your protocol has. So for example, this protocol works well with this type of sample, but does not perform well with this other type of sample. Or the calculations in our protocol are based on the following assumptions. Um, some additional tips. When you're writing in a protocol, you always want to write an active voice. So if you are copying your protocol in from your methods, you will need to change the way that you say things. So you want to use the active voice to give instructions. So for example, plate cells on a six well plate, you want to avoid the passive voice that we would use in publications. Cells were plated on a six well plate would not be something we would want to see in a protocol. If you give a range of values, you want to state the conditions under which someone should use the lower versus the upper end of the range. Including photos or short video clips can be really helpful for important steps, and consider adding a graphical abstract to illustrate the flow of steps. This is another article that I will simply leave here for you to find. It has some more tips on how to write a reproducible lab protocol. Um, one other question that I get is, if I deposit all of my protocols, do I still need a method section? And the answer to this question is that you always need a method section, even if all of your protocols are deposited. There are two reasons for this. Um, again, everyone needs to understand the study design and the methods that you use to answer your research question, as well as have the information needed to assess scientific rigor and the risk of bias. And those are going to be in the method section of your paper, along with some details about how the methods were actually performed. Okay, so in the workshop, uh, we would encourage each of you to bring your own protocol and you might want to spend some time in advance looking at the repositories to think about what makes a good protocol. Um, search for something that you're familiar with. Hopefully you'll find more than one protocol and you can get a sense of which ones are better, which ones are not as good, with what features would be helpful um, for you to have when you're looking at these protocols and why are those features helpful. In class, we will be working on depositing a protocol. So the best way to learn to use a protocol repository is simply by doing it. 
So we'll ask each of you to start entering your protocol into the protocol repository, and we'll ask you to include our IDs for your materials list. Um, you don't necessarily have to make your protocol for public, so when you finish depositing the protocol, you can decide whether or not you actually want to publish it and get a DOI, or whether you want to just leave it private and use this as a learning exercise. And you can also make it public at any point during the future. Um, so it's, it's not a decision that you have to make in, in class whether or not you want to deposit your protocol. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, that is the end of our class for today, and we look forward to seeing you in class on Friday.